I would like to invite Nick and Mark on stage uh, to, to talk with us about their experiences using this. We're very fortunate to have them because Nick and Mark have been using um, these tools for quite some time, so I think it will be a very insightful uh, discussion. So welcome, Nick and Mark. Thanks for having us. Yeah, happy to be here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with uh, an easy one, Nick, for you, which is sure. why Chrome? So why did it make sense for you to look at the browser to help secure your enterprise environment? Yeah. Uh, look, we're an engineering company, but we're also a sales and marketing company. And most of our employees live their whole corporate IT experience through the browser, which is Chrome. We also have some parts of our leadership team that are from Google uh, that have written books on browser security, such as The Tangle Web, written by Michael Zalewski, who was previously our VP of security before retiring. And we've placed a strong emphasis on the browser as a, as a result of that. And we actually feel the Google security program and capabilities are, are very strong and I think better than a lot of other vendors. We place a lot of trust and confidence in Google. Uh, just as a single canonical example to reference, uh, there's a Google project called Project Zero that tracks zero days. So I think some of you probably are familiar with this. It was uh, an, a really an iconic project that was launched in 2014. Now it's been running for nearly 10 years. And so ahead of this session, I actually studied the data around number of RCEs discovered in various products, including Google Chrome, and the time to remediation. It's very important, right? Our whole world is remediation bound. <laughs> The average time of remediation for most products, including non-browser products, but just for sake of the argument, was about 15 days from a zero day. Google's Chrome remediation was 6.04 days. That's really impressive. That's more than two times faster. And so if we were to pick a browser for the company that we place a lot of trust and confidence in, using Google Chrome with six, six day remediation from a zero day dropping is world class. So for us, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know the team puts a lot of emphasis on making sure that we get security right. And so I think a lot of people will be very happy to, to hear that reference. Um, let's actually switch over to uh, browser management. So uh, you've been an early user and adopter of our management tools when it comes to managing Chrome. So tell me a little bit about your experience when it comes to managing Chrome browser. What do you use it for? What kind of benefits do you get out of it? Yeah, we've been using CBC on the Chrome browser management for going on three years now. Uh, we use it to manage the version of Chrome that's deployed. We also use it to enforce uh, up, uh, updates and patching to Chrome. We also use it for uh, extension management. We, we use it to push a endpoint verification extension that we use as part of our uh, custom solution around uh, device trust is what we call that. So we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Mark will talk about that a bit more. Uh, we're using it now for DLP prevention, the feature that, you, that we talked about on the screen, we have this enabled and we're running this and we, we're seeing improvements in user hygiene and behaviors as a result of that. We're, we're, we're full in. That's great. Um, actually, yeah, let's switch over to Mark now and talk uh, zero trust for a minute. So at Snap, you have an interesting approach to how you're uh, handling zero trust. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and how these solutions that people have seen today kind of fit in? Yeah, definitely. So um, we at Snap, we have a pretty custom integration with uh, Bianca for Enterprise. Uh, that's not out of, uh, we didn't really want to have this custom integration. You know, if we had IP in the very beginning, we probably would have used IP based solutions. But, um, you know, we were pretty far advanced when IP came out. We had, uh, you know, about half of the things that we, we needed in order to have a zero trust solution. So, you know, the things that you actually need in, in general uh, wording is like you need a method machine identity, you need a device inventory, you need uh, some place to actually define access policies, and then you need some place to enforce those access policies in an access proxy. And at Snap, we had an access proxy and we had a device inventory. So pulling out, ripping out our solution and putting in the IAP-based solution uh, wasn't really gonna, gonna work. We also had a, a bunch of custom authentication schemes that only our access proxy uh, actually understood. So we had to find a way to actually uh, have IAP work together with our own uh, access proxy. 
And fortunately, we have a pretty good working relationship with Google, and we, uh, we involved Google at the very beginning uh, of the design phase, and actually came up with a pretty cool solution. And you know, looking back on it, it seems pretty simple, but at the time, we had no idea what we, what we needed to do. Um, but our solution is actually two hops, and our production security team actually helped us out a lot in this, uh, this design and this implementation. Um, but yeah, a request is generated from one of our machines uh, going to a backend service. It's going to go through IAP first. IAP is going to wrap that request with all of the access levels that we've defined that it actually is, uh, has passed, and then it's going to ship that request off to our internal access proxy for enforcement. Um, and what we wanted to do in the very beginning is we wanted to restrict access to backend services just to uh, company-owned devices. And with the APIs that uh, Bianca Enterprise actually has available, it was really, really easy to build out a company-owned inventory. So what we do is we, we take our internal device inventory, compare it to Google's admin device inventory, and then the intersection of those two lists is actually our company uh, inventory. And we have just started actually enriching those device signals with uh, our own custom health score. And again, with uh, the Bianca Enterprise APIs that are available to us, it is really easy to actually add this. And this custom health score is computed by known vul vulnerability status per device, and that's uh, specifically operating system update status. And in the near future, we're going to add critical vulnerability status from our, uh, our vulnerability scan. Um, but yeah, that is pretty much our uh, entire, uh, what's it called, our entire setup for Bianca Enterprise. Um, in the future, we actually want to, you know, start increasing those device uh, attributes that we're collecting and adding them to our access decisions. Um, you know, stuff like encryption status or, you know, password, uh, password policy or even our, uh, the health of our tools that we are running on every single one of our devices. Um, the idea is, you know, if like your, if your device isn't, sending up logs to your log aggregator for some reason. You, know, you probably shouldn't have access to all of our you know, really sensitive uh, uh, data until that's, uh, that's fixed. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, it strikes me that we're here at Next. It's impossible to walk the halls without seeing the word AI. And we haven't said AI yet in this entire session. <laughs> let's change that. So let's change it. Um, so Nick. So AI is obviously a big topic here. Yeah. Uh, also, AI, while it has great possibilities when it comes to uh, helping employees be more productive and, and really increasing productivity, it also comes with some risks. So can you speak to how you've been using some of these technologies to help you mitigate some of those yeah. risks to AI? Yeah, look, I think the advancements in generative AI in the last 18 to 20 months are career changing for security professionals. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many requests we've gotten from the company to do various forms of uh, generative AI integrations, whether it's a Slack bond integration, whether it's a, uh, a like Jira ticketing flow type of integration, whether it's uh, tooling that's more AI optimized, whether it's just use of uh, open AIs, chat GPT, you know, for corporate purposes. And so we're trying to figure this out as we go. So we actually shipped a policy on this uh, about a week ago. We worked with our legal team for nearly four months on that. Uh, the policy's in place now. And then we've also shipped some enforcements for certain high-risk uh, AI usage, such as using ChatGPT to send source code from a Snap Managed browser, which generally we, we probably shouldn't be doing right. Uh, we warn on this right, right for now. We don't block on it yet. Uh, but as a result of just this feature being enabled for probably the last like four, four to five weeks, we've seen about a 50% decrease in the number of, of users attempting to do so. So like, we think the warnings are working. Uh, and this is all a matter of the DLP feature set that, that we, we talked about uh, pre prior to this. And our, our plans are really to expand this to all other sensitive data transfer attempts at Snap through Chrome. Um, and the beauty of all of this is, as, as you talked about, it just works. We don't need to employ another agent. We don't need another vendor. We don't need another context to manage. It's all through Chrome. And it's, it's fairly easy to set up. Uh, I, I think it's kind of magical. And so are you detecting specifically source code with, with these yeah, tools? So, source, codes, uh, source code, legal docs, and financial docs is the, the, the first set of categories that we've started with. And as I mentioned, just in four or five weeks, we've seen a decrease in, 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 in attempts. So we, we believe the, work, the, the warnings are working. And that's great. So that's making use of these um, you know, very customizable uh, DLP rules that are available. Um, all right. So 
let's uh, switch over to Mark and, and continue talking a little bit about uh, data loss. So obviously data loss prevention is a, is a big concern for enterprises. Tell me a little bit more about kind of plans for where you take this from here. Yeah, so, um, you know, like Nick said, you know, we, with the rollout of CVCM, we were able to really uh, simplify our whole browser strategy into just, uh, just Chrome. And we are just now realizing the impact or the, actually the, uh, the power of what these DLP rules can actually do. Um, what we want to do in the very beginning is we want to just, uh, you know, remove those, uh, those out of band or completely out of policy workflows that we've, uh, we've been noticing, you know, things like, um, uh, you probably shouldn't be uh, sharing a very, very top secret document to anywhere that's not you know, Google Drive, for instance. We want to block those workflows. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that is out there that we are noticing because we, we have enabled a bunch of these, uh, these rules in audit mode uh, that we haven't gotten to, gotten to yet, and we really need to get to that. Um, but a lot of our system teams are actually finding some really creative ways into uh, using these DLP rules and these DLP uh, logs. Uh, our application security team actually was interested in creating an internal secret scanner for, uh, for our wikis. And uh, what it will do is it'll, it'll you know, scan for all the downloads, uploads, paste events into our wikis. And if it's a credential, it'll either block it or warn the user and then warn a security team member that you know, this secret needs to be rotated. Um, our DNR team is actually pretty interested in ingesting the Chrome log, uh, logs. Um, and what they want to do is they want to uh, make sure that no user is reusing their corporate password on some shady, uh, shady site. And if they do, you know, we can actually notify them that they need to rotate their password. Um, for us, for corporate security, we actually have uh, an out-of-band uh, use case for these, uh, these rules where it's, it involves uh, SaaS security at scale. And you know, at, at Snap, we kind of follow the industry standard where if, you know, if, uh, if a user wants to use a SaaS application, uh, we review it, make sure you know, it's being used in the most secure uh, way. But after that, we really don't have, don't have any visibility into how this uh, application is being used. And with these DLP rules in audit mode, we actually get to see, we, we get a, a bunch more dimensions and to measure the sensitivity of uh, the actual application. We can answer like a bunch of questions. We can answer, uh, you know, how many approved, unapproved, uh, or even denied applications are still being used. Uh, you know, what user is inputting or downloading uh, data from, you know, SAS application B, what user is uploading uh, information to SAS application C. What we want to do with these, uh, these logs is we actually want to build out some sort of a uh, data map and uh, figure out how our data, how our corporate data is actually flowing uh, on the web on all these SaaS applications. And then with that, we can kind of create a baseline and that should inform us what DLP rules the, we want to uh, create afterwards. You know, anything that falls out of that baseline, we probably should either notify or, or block. You know, if, uh, if an engineer suddenly uh, inputted a 10,000 credit card uh, you know, uh, numbers into a, a design application, that should probably be blocked. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting to see, uh, you know, not just the blocking and warning features, but also the out-of-band things that we can actually do with these. Hmm. So it strikes me that uh, Snap is really at the forefront when it comes to deploying some of these security technologies. So Nick, do you have any kind of parting advice or advice for, for security yeah. professionals that are maybe starting to look at these uh, as options? Yeah, I, I think uh, Chrome is sometimes seen as a consumer product, and uh, a lot of the security leaders that I talk to in my, you know, my, my, my channels and LinkedIn's and things like this that maybe don't recognize the power of Google Chrome uh, for the enterprise. I honestly think it's it's an un, a kind of un, untold story, right? And there's there's sort of you know if I can name drop a little bit, there's there's competitive companies like Talon that are doing something similar, but I don't. I honestly don't think it's necessary if, if you use Google Chrome correctly and you make use of the feature sets like we have. Like we're full in and we're going to do much more, as Mark said, right? This is all part of our 24 roadmap that he outlined. And so I really just invite the room, you know, just purely from my, 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 my goal of protecting uh, corporate data and sharing, and sharing some wisdom, is like really take a look at the feature set. It's really powerful. Google's, Google's product management engineering teams are constantly innovating. Thank you, gentlemen. And the power of Google's security org is, is, is so strong and so robust that we have a lot of confidence in, in being, this being so focal to our strategy. I don't see that changing anytime soon. 
Great. And what about you, Mark? Do you have any advice as you've kind of looked at some of these technologies? What would you I, like to share with security professionals? I am around definitely the world? a bit more, a bit more in the weeds than, uh, than Nick is. And uh, if I have any advice, I would say just start early. You know, you're gonna you're gonna find some uh, some bumps in the road, and it's better to find those early. And uh, you know, don't uh, don't don't go too fast either. Uh, you know, don't uh, don't block your users from actually uh, you know doing their work. Uh, just uh, go slow and just look at the information as it comes. Yeah. All right. Well. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for, for joining us on stage and speaking about your experiences.